Good day, everyone. My name is Jennifer McGuffin. I am the Chief Communications Officer for the law firm of Romanucci and Blandin. Thank you for joining us today for the 360 Advocacy Webinar on Civil Rights Litigation. We are going to walk you through some of the intense and important events that happened in 2020 and take a look forward to 2021 and what we might expect. We have four terrific uh, panelists for you today who will share their expertise, and then we will end with Q&A. But you will first hear from Bobby DiCello of DiCello, Levitt, and Gutzler, followed by Antonio Romanucci. The two of them will take a case study approach to the nuances of having a police officer testify in your police misconduct case. Uh, they will be followed by Frank Aminat, who will pull on his more than 20 years in the Justice Department to talk about qualified immunity and the complexities there. And batting cleanup for us today will be Ben Crump, who will share his firsthand hands-on view with these high profile cases that took place this year. And I'll also lay out a platform for potential federal police reform in 2021. Uh, let's get started. Bobby DiCello, the floor is yours. So we, uh, we gather here today to, uh, to recognize that Americans are suffering. And I think uh, the reason why I'm here today is to help us who are in the practice of trial work, get at a key piece of resolving conflict in these cases with clarity and kindness. One of the most underexplored parts of the civil rights litigation reality is that oftentimes honest police officers are the key. And if not honest officers, cornered, officers are the key to getting the truthful information that these cases need. Uh, because we have a mixture of both media and practitioners on this call, I will not get into the behind the scenes kind of how to um, secret sauce of how this works, but I will, from my trial lawyer uh, colleagues, indicate that um, we can certainly talk again. And if you'd like to, I can certainly give you some of the uh, and I will give you all of the information that'll help you execute what I'm about to show you. And what I'm about to show you is how officers will testify without a deal that gets in the way of, of, of cross-examination and without doing it in a way that's underhanded or shady. Um, two very important pieces of how to maintain the integrity of the system. The last thing I wanna say about the system, I don't believe there's a central system, especially in this era of uh, post-election uh, victories that are being declared by a president who doesn't want to acknowledge his defeat. And the notion of some centralized control over a system seems a big thing for conspiracy theorists. My experience has been that I've been in many different systems. I've been in trials with juries and judges and um, defense lawyers, and each one of those rooms creates its own unique system. And maybe that is the system more like cells to the body rather than the body itself. And so within that system, we're gonna learn how I explored the issue of police cooperation in a case styled Arnold Black versus Detective Randy Hicks. So we'll get to that now. Uh, here you see the city of East Cleveland's 1970s style building, and it hasn't received many updates since then. The case is Arnold Black versus Detective Randy Hicks uh, we have three numbers in the, there in front of you for those who need the record numbers. Court number from Cuyahoga County is present there. Then the, the next layer of appeal that the case has gone through, we survived the appeal. The result of this case was upheld on local appeal. And then we have appeal to the Supreme Court that the city took and the, the Ohio Supreme Court rejected uh, application of cert. And so they are not going to be reviewing the case. As the case stands procedurally right now, uh, the city of East Cleveland is again trying to um, reverse uh, what the Eighth District Court of Appeals upheld and what the jury in the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas found. This case was featured in season three of the Serial Podcast. If you're a podcast person, I urge you to check out Serial 3. Um, it's a, it was a great production and, and I think a really honest assessment of what's happening in Cleveland, Ohio, which happens to be uh, the county uh, or the, the biggest city in Cuyahoga County. So on April 28th, 2012, a landscaper, Mr. Arnold Black, is driving home 
when he's stopped by Sergeant Detective Randy Hicks because he thinks Mr. Black's green truck looks familiar. Hicks pulls Mr. Black from his truck and searches him. Officer O'Leary arrives to assist. Detective Hicks handcuffs Mr. Black and walks him to the back of his truck where he is ordered to sit on the rear bumper. While handcuffed, Mr. Black is punched by Detective Hicks for not answering questions to Hicks's liking. Detective Hicks orders a stunned and bloodied Mr. Black to, take, to be taken to the East Cleveland jail. At the jail, officers do not put Mr. Black in a cell. Instead, they lock him in a windowless, dimly lit room with cleaning supplies, two disconnected payphones, and some rusty orange changing lockers. He's given no food, water, or bedding. Here's actual trial uh, exhibits of the pathway they took him through. You see that the door to this area is not even locked. It's got a clasp, the kind that you find on a dog leash that holds the door closed. And there you see the room where Arnold was held. On the back wall, you see some scrapes. That's where they took out other of these lockers. And on the floor, you see some scrape marks. That's where they removed the bench that Arnold sat on. That would be close to the lockers to the right of the screen. They also cleaned it up real good. And when we got there for the trial view inspection, they had bleach in the air. So you could smell the bleach as we were looking at it. Throughout the night, Mr. Black tries to find comfortable ways to sit on the floor. At one point, he urinates in a locker. Meanwhile, since Mr. Black fails to come home, his girlfriend, Erica, makes a missing persons report. After keeping Mr. Black in the storage area for four days, East Cleveland officers transfer him to the Cuyahoga County Jail with no booking papers. He's released hours later, but is not told why. He calls his girlfriend who picks him up and sees his head swollen, so swollen, she thinks it looks like he's wearing a helmet. Case of Arnold Black is tried for the first time and the jury returns a verdict of $22 million, but on appeal, the case is reversed and remanded for a new trial due to procedural irregularities in June of 2016. On August 5th, 2019, the second trial begins and at the second trial, both Hicks and O'Leary testify against the city and the chief. Both describe the violent events of Mr. Black's arrest as well as the violent customs and practices of the department. So how does Officer O'Leary describe Detective Hicks's use of force? Let's take a listen. And Supervisor uh, Detective Hicks strikes Arnold intentionally at that time. It wasn't an accident. It appeared to be intentional to me. It's not like he bumped into him or something. Arnold did not consent to provoke or encourage the violence that Detective Hicks initiated. Fair? I, yeah, I think that's fair to say. There was no legitimate public safety need for the violence against Arnold at that time. Would you agree? There was no necessity for a use of force at that time. And did O'Leary see Detective Hicks commit a crime? <clears throat> After witnessing the violent events of Arnold's arrest, you believed, didn't you, that Detective Hicks committed a crime? I believe that he committed an assault, correct. Sergeant Detective Hicks testifies about how he regarded Mr. Black's constitutional rights. And as a supervisor, you were personally involved in that violation of rights, isn't that right? His answer, yes. And you directed subordinate officers below you to disregard their duty and deprive Arnold of those rights. Answer, correct. Sergeant Hicks testifies about putting Mr. Black in jail. On the night that this occurred, you directed the men to drive Arnold to the station. Correct? Correct. And he had done nothing that by law required incarceration. Isn't that right? Answer, correct. In a set of admissions that went to the jury, Sergeant Detective Hicks admits why he put Mr. Black in jail. Detective Hicks was simply following the East Cleveland Police Department's custom and practice of jailing individuals like Mr. Black, who might pose a threat to the civil liability of the city when he pl placed Mr. Black in the East Cleveland jail without probable cause to justify Mr. Black's detention or arrest. How does Officer O'Leary describe the city jail and the room where Mr. Black was held? Uh, and the jail is like what you would perceive a Mexican or Turkish jail to be like, correct? It is. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Mr. Black is imprisoned in a back room storage area along with changing lockers that were referred to in the department as a holding cell. It, it's my understanding that that is where I, I don't have recollection of dealing with him on a 
any person to person basis after the arrest, uh, but it's my understanding that he was in the holding cell, which is a room a little bigger than this that has lockers and there's a couple phones in it. Your um, information about where he was placed came through fellow officers on or about April and May of 2012, is that right? Mm -hmm. And it can't, is that right? Yes, 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 I'm sorry. And the communications that you had would have been your capacity as a police officer with fellow officers, is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, this area is not a proper jail cell, though, is it? As a reasonable person, um, I would not believe, not being a jail expert, I don't believe that that particular room would be what would be used as a jail cell over beyond a temporary place to house somebody. Even though his video goes missing, O'Leary tells Chief Spots what Hicks did to Mr. Black, and the chief refuses to prosecute Hicks or take any action against him. So does O'Leary believe the chief tried to hide this? Does the missing video and an action by the city and chief lead you to believe, and do you in fact truly believe that the chief participated in a passive do nothing cover up in this case. So you're saying that because um, nothing was ultimately done and uh, by by anybody, basically, that there was no prosecution, was that a uh, covert way to basically hide this? Um, as that appearance to me. According to Sergeant Detective Hicks, how violent was it at the East Cleveland Police Department? Again, you were using intimidation tactics and threats of violence. That was something you did regularly. Answer, yes. That was something that former Chief Lane asked you to do. Answer, yes. That's something current Chief Spots would do when you worked with him. Isn't that right? Yes. In fact, there was a group that you and the chief had called the Jump Out Boys. Tell us about that. That was the street crimes unit before it was called the street crimes. Everybody in the street called it the Jump Out Boys. We'd ride through the streets and we'd chase drug dealers, jump out, out at them. When you would jump out at them, you'd use violence, wouldn't you? We'd throw them on the ground. Yeah, they ran, we'd catch them, beat them, boot them. Yes. What did Hicks say about how East Cleveland police officers treated people who mouthed off to them in the winter? Let's talk about how you would deal with people who mouthed off. How would you treat them and how, how was the department expecting you to deal with people who gathered on the corner or mouthed off at you guys? We were told to strip them down in the middle of winter, make it inconvenient for them to be on the corners. Strip down people naked? Well, they, were, they wear 16 layers of clothes. They'd have three pairs of jeans, two pairs of shorts, and six sweaters. How did East Cleveland police officers settle interdepartmental disputes? The department was marred with violence. In fact, it was a place where officers would challenge each other to fight in the city garage when having to do I have, I have heard, heard that, yes. Your, and what I want to be clear on is you understood that that's what took place at the city. Not that that's just something that you heard from some sort. That's something that you understood was common, that there was violence between even the officers. At time. I've so that, I'm not suggesting you fought someone. I'm saying that, that was something that was known at the department at that time. It's my understanding. All I can tell you is what, what I understood. Um, but yes, the, the guys, that, that would be, you know, if two guys have a problem, they go work it out in the garage. How was O'Leary trained by his field training officer to perform police work in East Cleveland? In light of your training on the right and wrong way to do things, you became accustomed, didn't you, to the manner or way in which police work was done in East Cleveland? Well, of course, um, if you spend time anywhere, you would be accustomed to that. Uh, East Cleveland was a very different place. Um, uh, sometimes resources were short, uh, including manpower. Uh, I kind of had to lie by the seat of your pants, so to speak, um, kind of roll with things. Um, there, there's like a, there was a, my training officer that I started with, Officer Cargow, uh, used to always say, there's the right way, the wrong way, and the East Cleveland way. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, I became accustomed to doing things probably differently or handling calls maybe differently than I would at, say, particular, my particular job now. So, uh, I'd like to wrap up my very brief presentation by saying um, it is an honor to be on this panel. 
Uh, I look forward to questions, I'm sure, by my practitioner colleagues about how to uh, get that kind of testimony. And again, uh, I promise you, if you reach out to me, I'll, I'll show you how we did that. What I wanted to also say in conclusion is that um, I, I thank each one of you who, who logged on today uh, and my panelists, Mr. Romanucci, Mr. Crump, Mr. Aminat, for allowing me the opportunity to speak on what I think is the most important social issue of our time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bobby. And my name is Tony Romanucci and I'm going to start sharing screen now also. Bobby, that was a great presentation. And you know, one of the takeaways that I have from what you just said is that, you know, that police officer said that there's the East Cleveland way. Well, it must be a small world because we have a Chicago way here also, and I don't know which way is better, but I'll tell you this, neither one is. We're gonna talk about really my presentation, I tried to title it a, a, a positive name. And so when you see the name, how, how one good apple beats the lies, really this, this presentation should be titled, if you lie, you die. And that's what we're gonna talk about here because the challenges that we face as attorneys and the media faces, and actually the, the police departments and municipalities across the country is fighting the false narrative. As soon as there's a police event, especially if there's a police involved shooting, and we see it time and time again, especially this year, highlighted this year, where white police, where white police officers are shooting unarmed black men, the first thing that happens is there's a narrative. And that narrative, I guarantee you, is 90 to 95% false. Even in George Floyd, which is unmistakable with what you see, the police department put out a false narrative immediately in that he was resisting arrest. I challenge anybody to look at that video and tell me where that man was resisting arrest. So that's the challenge that we face. So what I'm telling you as lawyers is that when you find the lie, embrace it. And what I mean by embracing it is that you have to work your case around the lie because not only do you die when you lie, but the jury will see that it, would, it will inflame them. And then of course, what's always worse than the truth? It's the cover up, right? What's always worse than, worse than the lie is the cover up is what happens. So we're gonna do our, our own case study here real quickly because we have limited time, but it's really important to show you how some of these lies started, how they were developed and how they turn into jury results that are very favorable. So you will see now that I have up the case study of Michael Laporta versus the city of Chicago. This was a verdict that was obtained a couple of years ago in the Northern District here of Illinois. And it was tried solely against the city of Chicago on Monell. There were no individual defendants in the case. The case remains um, on appeal in the Seventh Circuit. We don't have an opinion yet after the jury returned a favorable result uh, for Michael Laporta. The, the background is this. Michael Laporta and Patrick Kelly, who was an off-duty uh, Chicago police officer, were ostensibly best friends. Now, Mikey was the bigger one out of the two. He was the more good-looking guy. He was the stronger one. He had more going for him. They had been best friends forever, and there were always some jealousies between the two. There's no disputing that they were drinking one night uh, back in January of 2010 and they were both intoxicated and a gun went off inside of Patrick Kelly's home where they were drinking at about 4.30 in the morning. After the gun discharged, Patrick Kelly called 911 and said very calmly, my friend just committed suicide. I need a squad here. Pretty much in the same voice that I just repeated to you. So the narrative came out immediately and was broadcast, not only within internal dispatch, but by 911, that there was a suicide at the home of Patrick Kelly. And that's the narrative that the police department stuck with because 
If we're not in East Cleveland, we're in Chicago. If we're not in Chicago, we're in Los Angeles. If we're not in Los Angeles, we're in New York City. They covered up for Patrick Kelly. So you will see that this is the scene of the, the crime because it, although Patrick Kelly was never charged with the crime, um, this is criminal what he did. And, and that's another story right there. But the police department never investigated. They did what we call an under investigation. They, they kind of like looked at the scene, they took some pictures, they interviewed Patrick Kelly and Patrick Kelly told him my friend committed suicide. But what I didn't tell you was that by the time 911 arrived, Mike Laporta was alive. He was breathing. And that's when Patrick Kelly's demeanor changed. All of a sudden he became erratic. He started shouting. He tried to kick the paramedics out of the house. He, he hit one of the uh, sergeants on duty. Um, he became so loud and combative that the police actually had to place him under arrest because he was disturbing the scene. And that's because, because now I can say this with a great deal of confidence, as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's a verdict and the city has admitted it now. Patrick Kelly is the one who shot Michael Laporta. They got in a fight and because there were no witnesses, there were no cameras, there was no video, Patrick Kelly um, initiated the narrative of suicide and then the detectives, when they came over, even though Mike Laporta was alive and they took him away in an ambulance, he looked like he had no chance of living because the gunshot was to his brain with no exit wound. So, so this bullet had a great time inside of his skull ricocheting and shattering. So the, the detectives who were assigned to the case are, are, are out of a, a movie, out of, out of a movie. I mean, literally they were in the in the trench coats with the cigar, I mean, a cigar, the cigarette hanging out of the mouth. Um, they were foul mouth talking people and they used the foul language at trial too, because I got him to admit to using some of the foul language at deposition. So I got him to repeat it because he thought it was funny. And uh, clearly the jury didn't think it was too funny. So what you're seeing here in front of you are, are pictures of the scene that we had to, all of, all of those markings on there are our markings, because we had to retain all of the subject matter experts in order to prove that Patrick Kelly shot Michael Laporta. And the reason we had to do that was because, unfortunately, Michael's, uh, Mikey's you know, brain injury was so severe that his ability to recount the events of the evening were impossible. He could not do it. He could not do it. So we, we had to retain all of the subject matter experts, which amounted to 10, in order to recreate the scene and determine whether or not it was uh, biomechanically, forensically, physically, all of the evidence, whether it pointed in one direction or not. So you can see that um, in, in these photographs, those, those markings are by our, bio, by our biomechanical engineer who took all the measurements of where the blood spatter was in order to measure if it was consistent with what Patrick Kelly said where Mikey Laporta was when he shot himself. And you can see in the next, in the next slide, there's a picture of the gun. And then there are beer bottles uh, evidencing uh, their drinking. And then in the next photograph, you see the gun with a holster which makes no sense as to why the gun in the holster would be in the area where they are based upon Patrick Kelly's testimony that Mikey Laporta was inside the bedroom when he went and got the gun. And here we're looking at pictures of uh, the living room. The next one shows you, although this, for those of you familiar with, with CAT scans and MRIs, um, you're looking at an opposite view. So the gunshot entry, although it appears to be on the right side, is actually on the left side. And when you look at that angle, that 25 degree angle from front to back, it's an impossible angle for Mikey Laporta to have shot himself because Mike Laporta is right-handed. Um, there was more than ample and competent testimony 
showing evidence that Mikey Laporta was a right-handed shooter. He was very well versed in handling guns and shooting guns. He was not an ammunitions expert, but nearly so just because his family had a long history of using guns and hunting. Uh, and he was also, there was great testimony about how safety conscious he was around guns. So our biomechanical engineer testified that the angle at which the gun, the, the bullet wound entered his skull was an impossible, absolutely impossible uh, way for Mikey Laporta to have shot himself, but indeed was consistent with a right-handed shooter, meaning Patrick Kelly, pointing the gun at someone's head and discharging the gun and letting the bullet enter his skull. So we had really good uh, deposition and, and trial testimony um, evidencing these, this initial false narrative and then the way the police department perpetuated the false narrative and the lies. So we exposed them. And, and that's why I'm telling you, embrace the lie and then, and then I think you should chase the lie until you develop it to show clearly contrasting, contradicting testimony, because then you can set up the case beautifully, because not only is it a lie, it's a cover up. And once you bring that sort of evidence in front of a jury, they, they will punish, even though uh, in, in Illinois, we can't recover punitive damages against municipalities. They will punish the jury uh, I'm saying they will punish the defendant for the false testimony. So here you have some testimony, which I will help you, uh, which I will read. Um, you will see that one of the detectives was asked, did you find out about his blood alcohol level at some point? Now, Patrick Kelly was far more intoxicated than Michael Laporta. His, his blood alcohol level was 0.24. The answer was it was extremely high. So the question that I asked was, so how did you resolve that conflict with Patrick, tell Patrick Kelly telling you that he was not intoxicated where the science came back and said that he was? It says, well, I relied on the physical evidence. So did Patrick Kelly lie to you? Answer, yes. Did he lie to you any other time that you found during the course of your statement? Answer, I don't know. Well, we found out that Patrick Kelly lied not once, not twice, but multiple times. We just don't have enough time in this presentation to go through all of his lies. Um, he called the, the sergeant that I told you that he assaulted. He also called her a vulgar, vulgar name. And so the question was asked, um, and I always apologize before I say this because I don't use a word and I don't like to use it. So excuse me but it's the word that he called Sergeant Kilbasa. Amongst other things, he called her a blank. Answer, right. Well, you asked him whether or not he said that to her, so he called her that name. Do you remember that? Answer, yes, he denied it, right. So that's two lies so far, true? Answer, sure. So what continues to happen? Now, this is Lieutenant McNicholas. Lieutenant McNicholas is our good apple. He's the one who was, you know what? He didn't go out of his way to help us. All he did was tell the truth. That's what Lieutenant McNicholas did. He told the truth. He didn't go out of his way to help us. He didn't go out of his way to hurt Patrick. He didn't do anything except play the middle. And look at what happens when you play the middle. Lieutenant McNicholas was asked, is it a correct statement, Lieutenant McNicholas? Uh, here it is. Is it a correct statement, Lieutenant McNicholas, that while you were in charge there, that you advised the sworn members of the police department and the detectives that you wanted this to be an investigation leaning towards Patrick Kelly being the shooter? Answer, I told them to work it up as if it were a homicide. It's a lot easier to go down as far as how you handle the situation than go up. There's less things that you would do in terms of a suicide. Now, Lieutenant McNicholas was one of the first people on the scene. And when he saw the scene, he told the detectives and his captain that he wanted this worked up as a homicide, as an attempt homicide, and not as an attempt suicide. 
Because remember, Mikey Laporta was in extremely critical condition in the hospital, not expected to live. Lieutenant McNicholas was overruled. He was not only overruled by the detectives on the scene, but also by the superiors of the Chicago Police Department. And he was overruled and, he and, and the detectives were told to continue the investigation as an attempt suicide. So therefore, the investigation continued on to a lesser degree because they didn't have to do as much as if it was an attempt homicide. So now this is Detective Barsh. He's the, he's the guy out of um, Comedy Central, I would say, the trench coat and the cigarette hanging out of his mouth, mumbling profanities, um, not only to me, but also the jury thinking that he's funny. So what he tells us is that um, he classifies this as non-criminal, meaning attempt suicide, correct? Answer, correct. I ask him, show me in writing anywhere in your office file where you have at any time classified this investigation as an attempt homicide as opposed to attempt suicide. Can you do that? The answer is no. So now the beauty of what we've set up here, if you can see it, is we have a lieutenant who is saying this needs to be investigated as a homicide. And now we have the detective who says, I never investigated this as a homicide, only as an attempt suicide. So now we have not only the contradiction, but we have Patrick, Kelly, Patrick Kelly's lies. And that's the sort of evidence that we brought to trial. This is more testimony. Uh, one of the differences that on a shooting or an attempt murder or homicide suicide versus an actual murder is that in Illinois, we have to record any statement taken uh, or interview um, with the suspect. Well, that wasn't done. Patrick Kelly was never interviewed because, formally interviewed, recorded interview, because this was only investigated as a suicide and not a homicide. And now this is actual trial testimony. This is Lieutenant McNicholas. And, and you have to understand this was, this was perfect theater um, for um, very dramatic testimony in a case that, that Chicago was watching very closely because of the allegations that we were making against them. Because remember, these were all Monell allegations that we had. These were all custom practice and policy decisions that we say that the city of Chicago makes not only against Michael Laporta, but against the, the community, against the citizens of the city, that they have a code of silence, that they fail to discipline their officers, that they don't terminate them when they're supposed to be terminated that they don't investigate their claims, that they don't have an early warning system to weed out the bad officers. So this was a case that was on public display every day. The question, number two, you would agree that the truth is paramount in determining what would have happened that, that evening. Is that correct? Answer, that's correct. You would, you would not want, as a lieutenant who issued that instruction of an attempt homicide to have a short investigation concluded that would not arrive at the truth. Correct? Answer, correct. You would not want an investigation that circumvented any path towards finding the truth, would you? Answer, the truth has to come out. This is like Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise. This is all about the truth, ladies and gentlemen. And that's what I encourage you to do extract that testimony at trial, that your job, not only as an attorney, but their job as police officers are to come to the truth. This is not a Donald Trump world where we just talk about things that have no bases in fact, and then people believe it to be true. We must arrive at the truth. And so what happens when you arrive at the truth? Well, you get results. You get results where you see here, and I'm, I'm looking at my other screen, so I'm not looking away from you, but it's too small on my, my paper here. Did Patrick Kelly intentionally or with reckless indifference shoot Michael Laporta? 
Answer is yes. We proved even without Michael Laporta's testimony during the discovery phase of the case that Patrick Kelly shot him. And not only that, there were five Monell counts that we brought to the jury. The, the, the jury found in favor of three, and you can see the three that they found in favor of. However, they only found that two were causative of Michael Laporta's injuries, meaning the shot to the head. The next case I'm gonna to have to go through pretty quickly because my time is also running out but it's, it's another claim where we're going to go straight to the testimony of a horrible car crash of a police chase here in Chicago where the lies came out right away also. And we had one good officer. We had one good officer who decided to come out and tell the truth about what, whether or not this chase should have, should have been continued or discontinued because we had two competing sergeants who were listening to the chase as it was happening on radio. One of them said to continue, the other, the other one said to discontinue. So again, we have two competing uh, testimony here, and this is the one of Sergeant Doherty, who said it's so important from a question that I asked them, Sergeant Doherty, because we've heard that repeatedly, and it's only been the mouths from the attorney, because I had just finished my opening statement and he was our number one witness but we need to hear it from you because you're a witness in this case. Is it logical that in some circumstances it's okay to let the bad guy go? And here what we're talking about is the police officers were chasing a stolen vehicle. You can't chase property. You can't chase a hunk of metal because here what we're talking about is people over property. And that was our theme through the case, people over property, the choice to chase, and shared responsibility. Those eight words made up our entire case. We built our entire case around those eight words. People over property, the choice to chase, and shared responsibility. And Sergeant Doherty said, yes, it is okay to let the bad guy go because it's in that instance where it's people over property. True? And his answer was yes. I don't want to say game over, but we won that case probably within the first 24 hours of that jury hearing opening statement. And that's more trial testimony. And this is where he admits that he hears himself say the words discontinue, which means I ask him, well, discontinue means stop, right? So the jury understands that we're, when we're using the technical police term, really what it means is stop your chase, let the bad guy go, and let's save human life. Because when they continued the chase of the bad guys who were in the stolen car, it went through a stop sign and it hit the car where it contained our clients, killing one of them and injuring five other people very, very seriously and critically. And once again, what happens when you get people who tell lies and you're able to show those contradictions, well, you get a verdict. You get a verdict. And as you can see, I just want to point out, if you look at the top where it says verdict form A, here, here, here are there are three themes. At the top, it's people over property because we were able to prove that the officers did not value people over property. The bottom part of it is was the allocation, which is all about shared responsibility. And then, oh, we don't have the slide where, where we talk, oh, here it is, the special interrogatory. Did the course of action of those officers show an utter indifference or conscious disregard for the safety of others? And they answer that in the affirmative. And that's the choice to chase because conscious disregard means that you're making a choice. So we were able to prove all of our themes with the jury and they answered all of those in the affirmative. So that's the conclusion of, of the presentation with regard to finding the good apple and keeping in mind the maxim, if you lie, you die. And, and that is pretty much the theme of municipalities and police officers across the country. Their instinct is to cover up 
That's what the union uh, unions tell them to do. That's typically what upper ranks try to do. They protect their own. So be happy to answer questions later on in the presentation. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Frank, who's up next. And of course, my dear friend, Ben Crump. Can't wait to hear your words, Ben. Thank you, everybody. My name is Frank Aminat. Uh, I'm a, a partner at Dichel Levitt Gutzler in New York City. Uh, I'm really honored to be part of this panel with uh, such luminaries of the civil rights world as Ben Crump, Tony Romanucci, and my partner, Bobby DiCello. Um, I am, get my screen up here. So I will be uh, discussing the um, concept of qualified immunity. Uh, it's a large and complicated concept. I'm gonna give it a very quick overview uh, in, in, in the time that's allotted to me. It's certainly a, uh, a concept that has become very controversial in, uh, in uh, recent months as more and more uh, police officers and other government actors have been using it as a shield uh, against liability in civil rights cases. So um, let me first give a brief uh, discussion of the origins of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is generally considered to have been created by the Supreme Court in a decision called Pearson versus Ray, which was decided about three weeks before I was born. So I consider myself and qualified immunity to be about the same age. Hopefully I will, uh, with any luck, I will outlive it um, <laughs> to, uh, uh, um, but uh, uh, Pearson versus Ray was a famous civil rights case in itself that arose out of um, an incident in Mississippi where uh, a number of black and white religious leaders gathered together in a whites only bus terminal in a peaceful attempt to racially integrate it. And they were arrested by uh, police, local police officers there in Mississippi. And um, the arrests themselves took place in 1961. The statute under which they had been arrested was declared unconstitutional in 1965. So when they sued the officers in uh, a civil rights action under section 1983. They, the, the question was whether the police could be sued individually for actions that they believed were constitutional based on the laws that existed at the time of the arrest. And the case went up to the Supreme Court, which analogized the civil rights claim under section 1983 to a common law cause of action for false arrest and false imprisonment. And it said that because at common law, those types of claims were subject to an affirmative defense of good faith and probable cause, the Supreme Court decided that uh, Section 1983 claim should be subject to a similar defense. And so that defense of, uh, of good faith, uh, the origins of it were fairly humble, but they soon evolved into the doctrine of qualified immunity, which is a judge made doctrine. There's no statute, there's no law passed by Congress that says that there's qualified immunity. It's just um, uh, something that the Supreme Court invented. And generally speaking, it shields officials from individual liability for damages in civil rights claims, unless a plaintiff can show that the defendant violated constitutional rights that were clearly established at the time of the defendant's actions. And that language of clearly established is, um, as, as we'll see in a moment, is the key language. Um, so let's talk a moment about, about why we have qualified immunity from a public policy point of view. So remember that qualified immunity emerge, emerged in the context of a uh, type of legal action that was brought against individuals. Now, in Tony's presentation, he talked about the cases that they brought against the city of Chicago itself, and we'll get to that in a moment. But for most of the period of time that the Civil Rights uh, um, Act of 1871 has been in effect, the actions were brought against individual agents. 
against their personal assets for actions that were ostensibly taken in service to the public. And so there's a, it, was, it was believed that there was a public policy rationale that because the personal assets of these government, these public servants were at stake, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen unless there's a really good reason for it. And so that's why qualified immunity came to protect what uh, the Supreme Court called all but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly and intentionally violate a citizen's clearly established rights. Because it was believed that if it, it was too easy to get at the personal assets of, of public servants, people would choose not to serve, in the, in, uh, serve the public. People would choose not to become police officers. The second uh, primary rationale is what's, what's often called the policing is hard rationale, which is that you know, police officers and other law enforcement officers, uh, they often have to make split second quick decisions. We want them to be able to perform the discretionary functions of their jobs without fear of personal liability. They have to be able to act confidently, including through the use of lethal force when necessary, without second guessing themselves um, uh, in, in what could be life critical situations based on the fear of being sued. The Supreme Court said this in the Pearson case when they said a policeman's lot is not so unhappy that he must choose between being charged with dereliction of duty if he does not arrest when he has probable cause and being mulcted in damages if he does. Although the matter is not entirely free from doubt, the same consideration would seem to require excusing him from liability for acting under a statute that he reasonably believed to be valid, but that was later held unconstitutional on its face or as applied. That's the key holding of Pearson. So, on its face, the, the quality of the, the doctrine of qualified immunity has some superficial appeal. I mean, you can understand some of the policy under, underpinnings of it. But over time, the doctrine went astray. And this happened for, due to a couple of developments in the law that, that happened. One was that over time, there was considerable confusion over what counts as clearly established. And this confusion has made it difficult for civil rights plaintiffs to overcome the defense. This confusion has a couple of different dimensions. One is clearly established by whom? Is it only clearly established that the Supreme Court of the United States declares it to be a constitutional right? Or does it count if uh, courts of appeals or state courts declare it as being a constitutional right? The Supreme Court has never given a clear answer to that question. <coughs> Excuse me. And that has created considerable confusion. The second aspect of it is, when you talk about clearly established, does it have to be clearly established legally or factually? Well, the Supreme Court has held that qualified immunity applies unless prior to the action of a defendant, there was a specific court case that found the behavior unconstitutional under a pattern of facts that was sufficiently similar to the case before the court to have put the defendant on reasonable notice that his actions were unconstitutional. But when you say sufficiently similar, what does that mean? Um, similar at what level of specificity or generality? There's the famous case a few years ago where a, uh, a, a police dog attacked um, a suspect who was lying on the ground uh, with his hands in front of him. And um, when he, when he brought a civil rights action, he cited an earlier case where a police dog had attacked a, uh, an individual who was sitting up with his hands up. And he said, that's sufficiently similar facts. It's clearly established. But the court in that case said, no, lying down on the ground is different facts from sitting up and therefore granted qualified immunity. Um, the other reason the qualified immunity has gone astray is that the Supreme Court has muck the waters by changing the paradigm. So in a case called Saucier versus Katz decided in 2001, the Supreme Court said there's a two-step process. First, you ask yourself, did the defendant's actions violate the Constitution as we understand it now? Then, if the answer is yes, then you ask if the violation was clearly established at the time of the defendant's actions. So what this scheme did is it basically says that the first person who commits a certain unconstitutional act gets a free pass. 
because it has not been clearly established to that point of time. But afterwards, everyone who acts the same way is liable because now it's clearly established. So in theory, the availability of qualified immunity should diminish over time because every time there's a finding that somebody gets qualified immunity, it clearly establishes a right that the next person can use. But only eight years later, in a case called Pearson versus Callahan, a different Pearson, Supreme Court changed its mind. And it said courts can skip the first step and go straight to the second step. And uh, unless the plaintiff can show that the uh, violation was clearly established at the time of the defendant's actions, the court doesn't even look at whether it's a constitutional violation now. As a result, nothing ever gets clearly established, and it makes it much less likely that people can overcome the doctrine of qualified immunity. So um, as a result, qualified immunity has become increasingly successful over time as opposed to decreasingly successful. A recent study showed that from 2015 to 19, Qualified immunity was granted 57% of the time when it was asserted. So that begs the question whether qualified immunity should be eliminated. And more and more people are saying yes, including justices from opposite ends of the ideological spectrum. Justice Sotomayor has said that the doctrine renders the protections of the Fourth Amendment hollow um, and uh, inspires a shoot first, think later um, message to law enforcement officers. Justice Thomas has argued that qualified immunity is not supported by the statutory text of Section 1983. And of course, as, um, as Ben will, will discuss in his uh, presentation and as uh, uh, Bobby and Tony did as well, the doctrine creates a public impression that law enforcement officers are above the law and that they can act with impunity, that justice and accountability are elusive or even phantasmic. And the doctrine, in some senses, offends common sense. After all, why should officers who are specifically trained and who are given immense power be held to a lower standard than the rest of us? Um, so these public impressions tend to undermine the legitimacy of the legal system and add fuel to an already, already raging fires in our divided society. But I would, I would submit that another reason qualified immunity should be eliminated is because the main policy justifications that I discussed earlier for why we have qualified immunity in the first place no longer exist. As I mentioned, the primary justification for it is because you want to shield local police officers from personal liability for their public acts, the financial justification. But nowadays, in every city and county in the country, um, if a police officer is held personally liable for a civil rights violation, they will be indemnified or reimbursed by their agency, by their police department, by the city, by the county. This is at least a trend at the state and local level. Indemnification is less common at the federal level, but it's, it's gradually becoming um, uh, more prevalent even on the federal level. But studies show that in more than 99% of the cases where civil rights judgments or settlements are achieved against state and local agents, those individual defendants are fully indemnified by the city or county government and are made uh, and make no personal financial contribution to satisfying the settlement judgment. Which begs the question, why do we still have qualified immunity? Because the notion that people might be deferred from public service or might second guess their actions in times of emergency are really fallacies at this point. But those fallacies are the fundamental uh, policy underpinnings for qualified immunity, and more and more people are arguing that it should be ab abolished. But I would submit um, that a better question is, why do we have individual liability at all? Why not just uh, set up a system where we sue the government itself for actions of government agents that violate the rights of others? Now, to answer the question why we have individual liability, I'll do it very quickly, but I got to cover 150 years of legal history real quick. Okay. So at the time the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1871, neither the United States nor any state had waived sovereign immunity to permit any kind of tort action against the government. You couldn't sue uh, a go the government for a personal injury, certainly not based on what's called vicarious liability where an employer is held responsible for the bad actions of their employee. 
also known by the Latin phrase respondeat superior. Instead, if you were injured by a government action, you either had to go to Congress or the state legislature and have them pass a specific law giving you money from the government budget, or you had to sue the individual government official personally and take, chance, and take the chance that they may or may not actually have money that could satisfy a judgment. Congress didn't waive sovereign immunity for tort actions against the federal government or recognize a basis for vicarious liability until 1946 when it passed the statute called the Federal Tort Claims Act. But even then, the statute only allowed claims based on negligence. You couldn't sue based on what are called intentional torts, like assault, battery, false arrest. That didn't happen until 1974, when Congress uh, enacted uh, what's called the Law Enforcement Proviso, which said that if a investigative or law enforcement officer commits assault, battery, false imprisonment, false arrest, uh, or so forth, you could now sue the government, the federal government for its actions. But even then it said you can only do that if you do it based on a common law claim. You can't do it based on a civil rights claim, based on a constitutional tort. Um, so the progress in state courts was roughly the same. Um, uh, but most, but every state now allows itself to be sued for tort actions based on vicarious liability, uh, you know, with various exceptions. Um, but at the time the Civil Rights Act was passed, it never occurred to Congress to allow claims against state entities based on vicarious liability. And to this day, the Supreme Court has interpreted the statute as not allowing these kinds of claims. Now, uh, Tony mentioned this case called Monell, which the Supreme Court decided in 1978, which said that you could sue a city under the Civil Rights Statute, but only if the city itself committed a civil rights violation through a policy or an established custom or practice. You still can't sue uh, a city uh, solely because it employed somebody who violated the, um, uh, the civil rights. So this gets me to what I call a radical proposal. And I only call it radical because as far as I know, nobody else has made this proposal or talked about it in these terms. Although I think it's an eminently fair uh, and reasonable um, proposal, which is to shift away from having individual liability suits at all and make the government itself liable. Um, eliminating uh, qualified, uh, so one reason is there really isn't much political impetus to eliminate qualified immunity uh, through, statu uh, through uh, a statute. And it doesn't seem like there's an impetus in the Supreme Court either. So even if it makes sense, um, it, uh, um, it's unlikely to happen in, in the near term. Um, so uh, uh, what I think is a fair and better solution is to waive sovereign immunity to allow claims to be brought directly against the government. Um, and that this would be consistent with the way sovereign immunity has evolved, as I discussed. And it's also consistent with the fact that the governments are paying these judgments anyway. Um, I think this uh, proposal has, uh, I mean, Congress would have to waive sovereign immunity, amend uh, the statute, both uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act and the Federal Tort Claims Act. Um, and the government would still have certain uh, defenses, but it would change what's an amorphous judge-made doctrine into a more concrete statutory one. It would force the governments to internalize and self-insure against the cost of their employees' actions. Um, it would facilitate settlements, and I think it would save the government money, and it would increase the likelihood of recovery um, for plaintiffs. Um, anyway, I apologize for having gone uh, so quickly, um, but I would welcome any questions anybody has um, after uh, Ben's uh, presentation. And once again, I thank the sponsors for having uh, invited me to uh, participate in this panel. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, and certainly to Robert and my brother Tony, I'm so grateful and honored to be here with you all this evening to have this important conversation. And I'm kudos to uh, Jennifer McGuffin and Tony Ramanucci for having this important conversation to help us freedom fighters to sharpen our acts so as we transition from George Floyd's summer 
into the fight for freedom fall season, we can do so with the proper instruments uh, to wage this battle. And I say instruments because it has been my long held belief, uh, brothers and sisters, that we freedom fighters at the front line must make sure that the law is used as an instrument for good versus the enemies of equality using the law as a weapon to oppress. And so I think that's where we will begin our discussion talking about this moment in history. And I have a very distinguished uh, assistant to help me uh, with my <laughs> slides, uh, Attorney Robert Vicello, if you would, sir. Uh, the slide did not come up. One second, I'll get it. Okay. There it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and I'm going to talk about institutionalized racism and civil rights. And uh, we must fight institutional racism uh, at the utmost because it's the institutional racism oftentimes that holds more power over the lives of uh, people who have been oppressed than the individual acts of racism. Uh, it is institutionalized racism that allows schools to deny certain students access. It's institutionalized racism that allows banks uh, to deny loans to certain people. It's institutionalized racism that allows employers uh, to fire certain employees for arbitrary reasons. And it is absolutely institutionalized racism that allows police officers to kill certain people with no accountability. And so when we think about uh, 2020, the tragic deaths of succession of Black Americans by police that were captured on video and galvanized protests across the nation, I, I want to let my brothers and sisters know this as a, a black man, a person of color. And Tony, as you know, uh, I've often talked about my grandmother when she said, if you ever get a chance to speak truth to power, you do it, baby. And I know you all are some very powerful people, you freedom fighters who are fighting on the front line for those who have been disenfranchised and victimized and marginalized. And so my grandmother said, you are the people I need to speak to. And as a black man, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that America, while we all have had to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, we in black America have not only had to deal with that pandemic, but we've also had to deal with the 1619 pandemic. That 1619 representing the year when the first enslaved Africans were brought to America. And from that year to this one for 401 years, we have been dealing with systematic racism and oppression. And that is so pronounced in the form of policing in America. The fact that in the United States, police violence is a leading cause of young death of young black men. On average, unarmed blacks are three times more likely to be killed by police than unarmed whites. This is not a new problem. And we saw that play out with the killing of Breonna Taylor in our own apartment. We saw it play out with the killing of George Floyd, who Tony and I are fighting for his family. We saw it play out in the shooting of Jacob Blake Jr. in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And so while everything else in America seemed to shut down during the pandemic, 
the one thing that seemed to proliferate was racism and discrimination, especially by the police brutalizing black and brown people. Um, and so when we think about in 2020, Americans of all types took to the streets by the tens of thousands to demand, demand police reform, greater accountability and transparency. Um, it's very important to understand that we have a real moment here, brothers and sisters, and we have to take advantage of this moment to transform it into a movement uh, to have systematic reform in the culture and the behavior of policing in America. And, and it's so important that we are able to transform this pain we all collectively felt when we watched that video of George Floyd being tortured to death for eight minutes and 46 seconds with Officer Derek Sheldon's knee on his neck, that we can transform that pain into a sense of power. And, and most importantly, that we can transform all these protests happening in cities all across the, the world into policy, long-term policy that can hopefully prevent some of these hashtags. Uh, next slide, if you will, sir. A significant force in the emergence of this renewed social justice is the omnipresence of video. Now, let me stop there for just a quick second because for decades, black people have been saying the police brutalized me. The police used excessive force against me and nobody would believe us. But thank God for the advent of technology and body cams and dash cam video and especially cell phone video. Uh, it, it harkens back, Frank, to the Shakespeare play Othello. And you all remember the famous line where he said, I will believe you if you provide me ocular proof. Ocular proof. If you show me some evidence that we can see with our own eyes. And thank God, Robert, whether it's Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio on the playground in less than 1.7 seconds, this was a 12 year old baby playing on the playground by himself is shot and killed by the police. Can you imagine what the narrative would have been if there was no video? And then Antonio Ramanucci, think about in your hometown of uh, Chicago, Illinois, if there was no video of Laquan McDonald being executed like a dog in the street, the fact that you have 14 police officers lie and say that he was posing a threat to them. And that's why this one officer had to empty his clip and then start to shoot him again with a second clip before the, his co-fellow officers finally stopped him. The first bullet, when you look at the Laquan McDonald video, this 17 year old black boy is running away from the police. And the first bullet, right, Tony, takes him to the ground. And then the next 16 bullets or while this black child is face down and all the police officers lie to talk about Tony's presentation, talking about police officers who will lie and cover up. And so that's why video is so important because it gives us evidence in our fight for civil rights of those who have been marginalized like never before. So we can never ever lose that perspective that we must make things even more transparent. And we'll talk about that further in the presentation. Next slide, if you would, sir. Um, civil justice movements have risen in the past yet failed to produce 
meaningful reform. And one of the things I like to hearken, and I won't spend too much time on it because we're going to get to it in the beginning. And I, I welcome you all to join um, Tony and I in helping engage this new Biden-Harris administration, but also the United States Congress, who have put forth the George Floyd Justice and Policing Accountability Act. We need those good ideas that Frank Jess was talking about more than ever now, because we have their attention, they're listening. And when you think about the uh, George Floyd Justice and Police and Accountability Act, it is good proposed legislation. I mean, it addresses a lot of the systemic racism and injustices in policing that we need to speak to. The fact that the Congressional Black Caucus led this effort and they have been working on this probably as long as you and I have been working on it for decades now saying we have to do something about policing in America because our children are dying. I mean, it's that real. A lot of times people can't fathom that their children will be actually killed by the very people who are supposed to protect and defend them. And so that's why it means so much to certain people in certain communities, because every day that is their reality. When their teenagers go out the house, they say, will they be the next Trayvon Martin? Will they be the next Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri? Will they be the next Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio? Will they be the next Laquan McDonald in Chicago? Will they be the next Philando Castile in Minneapolis? Will they be the next Stephon Clark in Sacramento, California? Will they be the next Botham John in Dallas, Texas? Will they be the next Sandra Bland in Houston, uh, Texas? Will they be the next Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Louisiana? Will they be the next Eric Gardner in Staten Island, New York? Will they be the next uh, Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Oklahoma? I mean, will they be the next Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky? The next Pamela Turner, a uh, black woman laying on her back. She's pregnant. I mean, she's saying I'm pregnant and the police have no regard for her or her unborn child if you take her at a word and he shoots five times while she's on the ground killing her. That's why we have to reframe this relationship with the police and it has to be about transparency. Everybody has to see what happened and if the citizen did something wrong, hold them accountable. If the police did something wrong, hold them accountable. But it has to be, we all see what happened. Transparency, number one, plus accountability, number two. And then that's how we get to trust because the problem is mistrust between law enforcement and communities of color. And, and, you know, it's so deep when you think about that. And thanks for putting that slide up. The police and the public differ on the perceptions of deadly police encounters. Officers believe that there are isolated incidents, uh, 67%, where only 31% believe it's a sign of a broader problem. But when you just oppose that with the public, they believe 39% that it's isolated incidents when police kill black people, but 60% of the public believes that it's a larger problem. Amongst just white people, officers 72% believe it, that it's an isolated incident, while 27 believe it's a broader incident. White citizens 44% of the time believe it's an isolated incident. But I think George Floyd had a lot to do with this. That number is increasing. 54% believes that it's part of a, a bigger problem. And amongst Blacks, you know, 43% of the officers believe it's isolated incidents. 57% believe it's part of a larger problem. And the last thing on that slide said almost 79% 
almost all black people believe it's part of a bigger problem because we've seen it our whole life. You can go to the next slide. Um, do Americans understand the challenges police face? Um, you know, it's real simple. We must respect police, but the police must also respect us. It goes both ways. It can't be a one-way street. I used to go on a certain news network and a certain guy who ran the spin factor or the no spin factor, he would say to me, Tony, uh, after we would have one of these high profile cases, he would say, well, Ben, you're an uh, upstanding counselor. You are uh, a powerful, dignified lawyer. Now you're not saying that all police officers are bad, are you? Because wouldn't you agree that most police officers are good people? And what I would say to him, Jennifer, as dignified as I can, you're not saying all black people are bad, are you? Because wouldn't you agree most of them are good? We can't let the police have the high ground on morality in this issue. Uh, they are people just like you and I. There's some good in the worst of them and some bad in the best of them, just like regular citizens. So we have to continue to fight that notion and make sure it's about respect. Uh, for everybody. Next slide, please. Republicans most likely uh, believe police are held accountable while Democrats don't. And, and that's politics. But what I'll say to this here, it's really simple. It's like when we go in courtrooms and, you know, uh, Robert, you're talking to predominantly white juries because America is 73% white. And what I say is I know you can quote the Declaration of Independence, but what I wanna know is do you believe the Declaration of Independence? Do you believe it when we say we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equally, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that amongst them are life and liberty in the pursuit of happiness? Well, America, that means black people too. And, and you just want to make sure they commit, when you select in that jury, that they believe the Declaration of Independence applies to all Americans. And that's beyond politics. It's like Martin Luther King said, just because they say it's legal, that doesn't make it right. They said that everything Hitler did to the Jews in Germany was legal, but that didn't make it right. They said slavery was legal. That didn't make it right. They said segregation was legal, but that doesn't make it right. And when they say killing your plot was legal and justified, that doesn't make it right. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the queue. Uh, the first from Barry Ryan. What do you do when the arresting officer is subsequently convicted of A and B in terms of getting insurance coverage and is qualified immunity precluded as a defense? So of course, when you say convicted of assault and battery, those are, those are common law crimes, which don't necessarily require a showing of a uh, constitutional violation. And so uh, the elements of that kind of a criminal conviction are gonna be different than the elements of a civil, uh, civil rights claim. Um, and so qualified immunity arises in the civil context uh, and so it would not be precluded as a defense. Uh, I mean, the, the two are basically separate because in the civil case, you'd have to show that the constitutional violation was clearly established, which you would not have to do in the criminal case. Thank you, Frank. And, and let me just put the call out for any additional questions using the Q&A function. If you have something you'd like to submit in the next few minutes. Uh, we do have another question coming in from uh, an anonymous attendee. When an off-duty officer activates themselves as a police officer, announcing themselves as an officer and displaying a badge and arresting an individual, is that officer now acting under the color of law? Uh, Tony, do you have a view? Uh, sure, I, I mean, in, in that situation, very likely he will be acting under the color of law. Uh, there, is, uh, there, is, there are directives and orders that exist in municipalities across the country that an officer is on duty. 24 hours, although they have technically off-duty hours, uh, that means that they're not wearing their uniform. And, 
you know, they may or may not be carrying their, their weapon at that particular time. However, if an officer sees uh, a crime while he's off duty and he, he can use his color of law absolutely to an, announce his office uh, even when he's off duty. So now the, the question becomes if, if that officer commits uh, a crime while he's off duty under the purported uh, color of law, is that a constitutional violation? And as Frank earlier answered, uh, the answer is likely yes. Um, yes, I mean, if he's acting under the color of law and violates somebody's constitutional rights um, while he's off duty, but announces himself, it's, it's a violation. Thank you, Tony. Next question from Savannah Kennedy. When BWC videos are edited or go missing, have you had success on spoilation claims? Bobby, do you have a view? Yeah, we've had, uh... In the Arnold Black case, which, by the way, I want to, I want to, first of all, thank you for asking the questions, everyone. And I, I just want to say how moved I was by the presentations of Frank and, and, and Antonio, but especially Ben. Um, you know, what an honor it is to have you leading us in this fight. Uh, to call us freedom fighters is exactly correct. And what we found in the Arnold Black case, a case, by the way, I didn't tell you the, the result. It was a $50 million verdict, again, held on appeal, was that, um, they had destroyed not only the, the, um, the video, but they destroyed the entire set of files and folders relating to every police officer involved, as well as the, um, the police report uh, file itself. So uh, what, what that did for us was that got us some very, very, very strong orders from the judge limiting what they could do in trial. Because when we were able to show under Ohio law that there was the destruction of evidence and the refusal to comply with discovery, we got uh, a, a case that was frankly um, supercharged. So yeah, you can, those, those kinds of issues in the BWC context and others, very powerful. And I'd be happy to talk to, uh, and I, I certainly I'm sure Aunt, uh, Tony would and so would Ben about any of that that you have the questions. Uh, let me ask the next question. With the change of administration coming in January, what do you expect to happen as it relates to police misconduct cases, uh, and when? Ben? Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and I, I'm equally honored to be with uh, you guys. I can't say that enough. Great job. Uh, first 100 days, first 100 days, that's what uh, President-elect Joe Biden has said, that he will address criminal justice reform. And so if you have some ideas that you can share, even with Jennifer and she'll give him the tone and I, we are, are going to have some entree into discussions with what we think can make it just a, a more constitutional guarantee to citizens. We're not asking for anything uh, special, just to give marginalized people a chance at justice, just like all the rest of us. And I will say this, there's, <laughs> we, the big things, no not warrants, choke holes, obviously Brianna George, they're gonna address those, but also body camera video, transparency. And if a police turns off that body camera, what Tony and I are suggesting that it be a federal obstruction uh, of justice violation where you have a rebuttable presumption, not saying the police don't get their due process of the law, but if that video is off, and somebody's brutalized or worse killed, then you got to explain why it wasn't something illegal, improper, or nefarious that happened for that body camera being off. Thank you. Anyone else with a view? What happens in January and beyond? Sure, I can chime in. Uh, look, having worked in the government through four different administrations, I can say that normally speaking, the transition from one administration to the next uh, is not as pronounced as most people think it might be. However, I somehow suspect that the transition from the current administration to the next is gonna be a, a much starker difference than is typically the case. Um, I think you'll see uh, differences in policy uh, along the lines of what uh, Ben was alluding to, but you also see differences in priorities and in resource allocation um, uh, that, that are going to be somewhat stark. You'll see, I think the Department of Justice will be more aggressive in, 
in prosecuting civil rights cases, both civilly and, and criminally. Um, you know, there's a there's there's a little known uh, component of the Justice Department called the Community Relations Service, which does a great job of helping communities that are uh, that, that are in facing strife uh, come together, and you know, it, it mediates um, community relations. That organization has basically been gutted in the current administration. I expect the next administration will uh, resume. Um, the the efforts of that organization and also give more uh funding to police training and community or oriented policing services and things like that thank you frank well uh we are just at about the top of the hour so do need to wrap but i just wanted to thank our speakers bobby DiCello, antonio romanucci frank aminette and ben crump not only for your comments today but for the work you do every day uh 360 advocacy will be sharing both the recording of this session, as well as the slides. If you are a member of the media, those will be distributed through the channels by which you received this communication. So thank you for your time today and your good questions. And please have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be well, Bobby, Frank, Ben. See you soon. Tony, Ben, Frank, love you guys. Thank you. Hey. Uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Jennifer, thank you. For, uh, for moderating. And thank all the participants, too. Thank you.